Before we talk more about flow, let's talk about grading. At the end of uh, the lecture on Tuesday, several people uh, came up to me and said, oh my god, I only got nine points out of 15. I can't afford to fail this course. And that's an F, right? Mathematically, who's done that? Nine fifteenths is what percentage? Sixty percent? That's a D minus, right? Who got a nine or lower? Oh my god. Right? Are you guys gonna fail the class? constrained, it's way too polite to do justice to all this effort. If you're going to go through all this work, I'm going to give you a real grade, I'm going to give you real feedback, and I'm going to give you a grade somewhere between 0 and 15, depending on how well you did. I'm not going to give everyone a polite 13, and someone really kills it a 14, and someone really blows it a 12. Life's too short for that. I'm going to give you a real grade to help you and then I'm going to ask you to do it four times this semester, right? You're going to do the sketch exercise four times. So you can blow it on the first time, get slightly better on the second time, get significantly better on the third time, and by the end of the semester, you should be killing it. Everyone should be killing it. The only way you can get to the fourth attempt and kill it is if you get real feedback about what worked and what didn't work. So I'm giving you real feedback about what worked and didn't work. It's not like I don't care what grade you end the class with. I absolutely do. I'm obligated to make sure that one thing doesn't interfere with the other. But the primary objective is to give you the feedback you need to understand what worked, what didn't work, how to do better next time, and do that repeatedly until you are you are confidently mastering this task. And your classmates who did really well with these sketch assignments, uh, you can talk to them. They probably did not eyeball it, right? Over there, didn't look at the picture and then eyeball it, right? What's, what's the secret weapon of doing these sketches really well? They're doing a very precise thing. Doing what? Tracing? Is that cheating? Is it cheating to trace? No, it's not cheating to trace. If you were born with a godlike talent for reproducing photos, then do that. How many people were born with a godlike talent to do Okay, you go ahead and do that. How many people were not born with a godlike talent for doing that? Okay, for you guys, I suggest you trace it. But what's the thing about tracing? Are you going to trace every single detail until it looks like a photograph? No, you're not. You don't have time for that. Who's got that? I've got a studio with you tomorrow. I don't have time to trace every detail. Right? I don't know about you. Friends don't let friends trace every detail. You live life as if you were going to die someday. And that you were going to have a deadline someday this week. Live life as if you don't have all the time in the world. <clears throat> Live life as if an all-nighter might not save your butt. Right? Decide what you want to get out of your, the exercise. Go in, get that, and then move on. Right? So if you're tracing something, what are you going to draw? You, you're only going to draw a line if it's a, it's a piece of the architecture. 
that is meaningful. That's how drawing works. You don't draw the meaningless stuff. You draw the most meaningful things, and you leave the rest. You're very selective. You selectively depict some things and selectively suppress other things. And you do that on purpose, because you are critical about what matters. You are critical thinkers, and you very carefully draw what matters and leave out what doesn't matter. And you draw it at least three in three different ways, and they are connected together. These sketch exercises are a vehicle for accessing the world in a way that other people don't access the world. Remember number two? Number one, the world is the main source of understanding. Number two, you as architects have access to an understanding of the world through architecture and other architectural methods that other people don't have access to. This sketch exercise is you deploying your superpowers to gain access to an understanding of the world that other people don't have. Don't squander it by drawing every detail. When you trace, I, you know, I, I suggest doing it on vellum and putting it right on top of your computer screen, which happens to glow. And it's like a light table. So you can draw right on the light table of your screen with vellum. I don't know if Christine is going to go for that. But, you know, to not do that is to waste your time. And I can't stand that. I can't stand you wasting your time. So get at the sketch part through whatever means. And you are make sure that you are being critical of sketchers. You are drawing what matters and leaving out what doesn't matter. The different sketches relate to each other. And when you write words, what should the words do? What is the purpose of the words? Is it to add extra information? For example, you've drawn three brilliant sketches of the Bruce's 1843 Bibliothèque saint Geneviève. Now you want to, we're supposed to write words? Okay, I'm going to write words. Uh, the Library of San Genevieve uh, contains over one million volumes. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Bad idea. Who cares? This is not a demonstration of your capacity to access ex extra information on Wikipedia. This is your chance to use words to add value to what you have drawn, right? You draw it, and then the words are the secondary element to make sure the message gets through. And throughout the whole thing, your job is to get at the big ideas that are conveyed through these architectures. Questions about the sketch exercises? OK. You're going to, everyone's going to get significantly higher scores than they did last time? OK. If you have questions, ask me uh, next lecture, OK, um, or after class. So today's lecture, back to my original question, have you ever lost yourself in your work in a pleasant way? You just lost track of time, and you're kind of disappointed when you have to stop. Who's felt that? For many of us, it's why we put up with all the hardship of the career in architecture. Because we get addicted to that feeling. We struggle, we have a problem to solve, and we can't just avoid it. We have to solve this problem. It's like a dog with a bone. You just can't let go. You have to push it, draw it, push it, model it, push it. It's gonna, it's gonna, and then finally, you get lost in the problem solving, and you lose track of time, and the drawings seem to take on a life now how many people have felt that? Have felt that? So it's called flow. There's a whole literature of flow. And different people call it different things. But there's a chance that if you end up sticking with architecture, it has something to do with that feeling of bliss, of productive work. So William Morris felt that. And he felt that he pursued that, and he pursued it by making wallpaper. 
So that's the in-class exercise. Do what Philip Morris did in this in-class exercise. There's a grid pattern on this paper. And if you draw a pattern in one of the squares, can you see the darker and lighter uh, points of the grid? You see that? So there's a little three by three square and it's repeated. Pick one of those three by three squares, draw a pattern in a way where when you connect them together, they flow into each other. I don't know how to explain it other than that. This does that. Is there a grid? Can you see the grid pattern under this wallpaper? So there's a grid pattern inherent in this. And you see the symmetry, you see the repetition. And the key is that however you divide it, uh, the lines coming from one grid into the next, when it crosses the grid line, it somehow connects. So in the upper left corner of your first pattern, if a line comes, if a line starts in the upper left quadrant, you need to then connect it to the lower right quadrant so that uh, it crosses over that grid line. So you don't see this grid pattern so, so blatant. Does that make sense? This turns out to be a very highly mathematical uh, very sophisticated set of mathematics involved in doing this. And people have uh, made equations out of the problem that is the wallpaper pattern. But um, if, you, if your brain works that way, go ahead and look into the mathematics. Um, but for most of you, um, it's probably just a wonderful uh, sketch exercise. And the thing is that William Morris loved to do this, it gave him pleasure. If he, had, if he had all the time in the world to do anything he wanted, this is what he would be doing. He would be doodling like you're doing. And he would do it all day long, every day. Uh, and he was a wealthy man, but he found a way to take his blissful doodling and turn it into a business. So he became even wealthier because he was able to take his doodling and produce wallpaper that became uh, world famous and still to the present. It's a very important thing. So what are some of the questions we might ask coming out of this lecture? What are the characteristics of the arts and crafts movement? And show us and explain how architecture demonstrates those characteristics of the arts and crafts movement. Again, it's a show and explain Missouri rules exercise. Remember Missouri rules? Don't say anything that you're not showing. Same as in studio. When you stand up before your, your jury, your review tomorrow, make sure that you don't try to say anything that you're not showing. And make sure you're showing something important. Here's another one. What's going on here? Who did it? And what are, the, what are the key ideas represented in this diagram? So those are just two examples of the kinds of questions. This one covers an awful lot. In a way, this covers the whole class. Every quiz question, as you will recall, is some version of this. Either here's two pictures, What's going on here? Show it by drawing over the pictures, tracing over the pictures, uh, and explain what's going on, or make a quick sketch to help explain what the key ideas are. So remember this, Pugin's 1836 contrasts. He was saying that the city of 1840 is not so great. The Industrial Revolution, all the dirty factory effluents into the river, see the Panopticon prison there in the foreground? Uh, not so great. Uh, comparison with 400 years ago in the medieval world where you had churches, you had the Gothic architecture, you had the landscape, the productive landscape, people working with their hands to feed themselves and each other. 
Uh, there was something moral about the landscape. And this was Pugin's appeal to uh, whoever would listen to bring back the Gothic architectural style, but not just the architecture, the Gothic way of life, the go Gothic culture, the Gothic religiosity, as an organizing set of principles for all of human society. So this is a weird thing to us here in the 21st century. Architecture is just this thing that rich people and corporations pay for. What does that have to do with human societies, right? right? Well, back then, it did have to do with human societies. When they wanted to change society, when they wanted to improve how things were going, when they had a political mission, who are you going to call? Thank you. So Pugin's ideas morphed very quickly into Ruskin's ideas. Remember Ruskin, John Ruskin? He was also a very strong promoter of the Gothic revival. And I've added one thing. This is a familiar slide, but there's a new thing down here. Not only did he publish these two uh, landmark books, uh, but he also founded, in 1841, St. George's Guild. So what's a guild? That would be a great quiz question. What's a guild and why is a guild important? Well, let's go back to this. Ruskin's key question about the production of anything is was it done with enjoyment? Was the producer happy while he or she was producing? What's that? So Ruskin, John Ruskin uh, did his thing, and he started a guild. And these guilds started popping up all over. They became very popular throughout England and then eventually elsewhere. And one of the big promoters of the guild system was William Morris. He's the, the wallpaper designer that we're talking about. And he uh, spoke out against ornamental acts excess, um, revivals, stylistic revivals, and uh, the alienation between uh, people's work and, uh, and their life. So uh, who's got student loans? Me too. So this is uh, one of the things that they were responding against. Let's get, where is this? I'm going to jump up to this. So the student loan thing, for most people who go to college these days, has an impact on the life choices we make when we graduate, right? We have the option of working uh, in a job we really, really want to do because we really enjoy this type of work. But we can't take that job if there's another option of working for CBD downtown because they pay a lot more, right? Why? Because I have student loans. I can't afford to... Uh, to do this, to, to do the job I want, I have to do the job that pays, that's going to pay. So uh, this is the iron cage of our own making. In 1905, uh, Max Weber, that's how you pronounce that, Max Weber uh, was one of the founders of the, uh, the science of sociology. And he made a point that there's a downside to the Enlightenment. Remember the Enlightenment? Where God and church were dislocated out of the center of power and authority, and uh, all of a sudden rational scientific thought could be uh, the source of all understanding, uh, accessible to any human. Well, that sounds pretty damn good, right? And so far, we've been talking about this as a fantastic thing. But what could the downside of the Enlightenment 
And this is a discussion that's raging right now. Wherever political uh, discussions around uh, nationality, around religions, around the return to uh, fundamentals, um, I think to a large extent the presidency of uh, Donald Trump is a referendum on the Enlightenment. When people are saying there is no truth, or the truth is, is up for debate, that is a counter-enlightenment move. And it's a popular thing because there is a downside to the enlightenment. So this, the enlightenment revolution set up all of these bureaucratic systems of capitalist production, the industrial revolution, higher education, uh, go to school, get a job, have a career, and it's a highly uh, rigid system that has been monetized. Sorry about that, but the colleges of uh, North America, of which Wentworth is one, is part of this iron cage. Yes, it offers unprecedented possibilities, but it comes at a cost, and that cost will keep going up until there's some major corrective measure uh, to trigger uh, colleges and universities starting to control their cost structure. And as long as there are students willing to pay these high tuitions, the colleges are going to continue to charge what they charge. And we are all locked in this iron cage of our own making, of the bureaucratic system. And so no wonder there was pushback. So there's understandably pushback saying, there has to be a different way. There's got to be an alternative to this. And that's what uh, William Morris and uh, his colleagues were promoting uh, through the Guild Movement and through the Arts and Crafts uh, Movement, where the key question was, how can we recover a state of things in which all work would be worth doing and at the same time, of itself, pleasant to do. So the reason, when we're locked in these iron cages of student loans and, and increasing real estate costs, like how are you ever going to have a down payment for a house? Uh, as long as these things cost so much, you're kind of stuck. You have to accept the highest paying job you can possibly get. At one point, I had uh, to abandon architecture and take a job as an executive in a health insurance company as director of communications because I needed a, a lot of money quickly. And I was lucky that I could uh, qualify for this job. And I got paid two or three times what I would normally get paid uh, in architecture. Uh, so it worked out, and now I'm back. Uh, and so how can you escape from the system. Well, William Morris and uh, his co-designer, Philip Webb, said, let's design a house. And let's design a house that, uh, you know how in our history of architecture class, they always tell you about the Gothic Revival, the neoclassicism, the Beaux-Arts, you know how they do that? Well, let's reject all of that. We've learned all about the importance of symmetry in the Beaux-Arts and the neoclassical. Uh, let's do everything but that. And so that's what they did. This house is a manifesto against the neoclassical, against the Gothic Revival, against the Beaux-Arts, against the Enlightenment. Basically, everything we learned in this class so far, they said, let's do, we can do anything we want as long as we don't do any of those things. So in a way, the Red House, a great response for a quiz question, would be, the Red House is the antithesis, which means the opposite of everything we've learned in this course and studied in this course so far, at least on the level of an argument. So uh, they tried to uh, avoid symmetry, although there is symmetry, but they introduced chimneys, clustered chimneys, rain gutters, and downspouts, uh, doorways, asymmetrical stair tower in the center, 
Uh, they're constantly changing window sizes. Like, remember the Beaux-Arts facades you did last class? We line everything up and all the windows need to be the same, line up the grid vertically and horizontally, and you have to be symmetric. Well, these guys are saying, let's do the opposite of that. Let's have as many different window sizes as we can possibly make, although some of them are repeated. Uh, but let's try to avoid that. And there are some Gothic arches, but let's try to avoid anything that would constitute Gothic revival. And so it's a manifesto, this house is a manifesto, against any historic reference. And in the process of building this house, uh, he invited lots of friends uh, to help join in, lots of artists saying, hey, can you paint a mural in this room? Hey, can you uh, make some furniture? We'll build it into a window. And so there was a community of artisans that formed around the construction of this house. And many of them, it's a large house, many of them moved in. And so it was like a commune. It was like one of the socialist utopian things we looked at last week. And so this house, if you're going to look for the big ideas of this house, it's not obvious, right? If you don't study for the quiz, you're going to come and say, eh, looks like uh, some houses in the town where I grew up. In a way, that's the whole point. The big deal about this house is it was the opposite of everything that they were supposed to do. It was the anti-great uh, architecture. And so the process of drawing it was itself a joyful activity. The process of doing the murals and the furniture had to be itself a joyful, productive activity. The bricks had to be expressive of the earth. It had to uh, use copper. It had to uh, deploy materials that were all bearing the, bearing the marks of the human hand and the human spirit. And so if, uh, if you end up working in a firm and your boss walks around and says, Who's not having fun today? And Jimmy raises his hand um, and he says, what's wrong, Jimmy? He says, well, uh, I'm under a lot of pressure. The plumber you know, is coming and we'll, we'll go, get out of here, right? Get out of here, go home, make sure your, your toilet's over. Right? Because I want you to be happy, right? That's an arts and crafts mentality where the process of doing joyful work takes priority over the productivity. That's an anti-capitalist move. Chances are your boss is under greater stress than you. And, um, and given what I've heard about starting salaries, it could be the boss of the firm you're working at when you graduate might be officially making less than you are. Because salaries are way up, have you heard? Architecture starting salaries are crazy good. So if you're going to be caught in an iron cage, now is a pretty good time. But you also might end up working in a place where they care about whether or not uh, you are happy. And they're trying to create a workplace culture of positivity that tends to be infectious. And some people argue at least for two or three period, two or three years, when their businesses are flourishing, that if their workers aren't happy, they're not going to make a profit. Um, and for as long as that lasts, fantastic. Good luck. Usually comes to a crashing halt. But William Morris and his Red House, both in the production of it, the design of it, the production of the house itself, was a celebration of the joy of making. And that should ring a bell because Wentworth, up until last week, uh, its primary mission was to be the school uh, of making. We make making the primary thing we do. We're rethinking that now for some reason. Um, but you can see in every detail that it is lovingly handcrafted, the laying of the brick. And so there's a lot of creativity in that, especially in the asymmetrical aspects. Um, and so it was a big house, and uh, I keep 
emphasizing how asymmetrical everything is. But are there any symmetrical elements? Do you see any symmetry? Some of the rooms have window locations that throw off the symmetry that's natural to a rectangle, right? But other rooms, like especially important rooms, there are certain aspects of symmetry to them. So general assemblage being asymmetrical, even if individual elements continue to be symmetrical. Now, this is something that we are going to see again in the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. So we have today's lecture, Arts and Crafts. We have Tuesday's lecture, Art Nouveau. And then a week from today, we finally get to Frank Lloyd Wright. And Frank Lloyd Wright is so important to so many things uh, that are true about the United States and as very few uh, histories of architecture acknowledge. Many of the modern movements that came out of Europe that you're going to be getting in module three uh, have direct, they grow directly out of the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. So in a way, I'm planting the seed here for a line of genealog genealogical line from the arts and crafts through uh, the European avant-garde movement you're going to get in module two uh, up to the present. So that's something to look for on the larger trajectory of, this, of these lectures. And so these slides are demonstrating how heavily handcrafted everything is. The use of built-in furniture is a very big deal here. Uh, the, the, the paneling on the walls. You never paint wood because you want to leave the grain of the wood to be expressed. Why? Where did that wood come from? Where did those trees come from? Nearby. So a big part of the arts and crafts. So you can get a slide like this. It's like, I don't know about you, when I got this slide when I was in history, it's like, what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. They don't paint the wood. They celebrate the grain of the wood because the grain of the wood speaks to the landscape out that window. It is all locally produced by local artisans. The guy walking down the dirt road out the window is the guy who cut down the tree. His brother-in-law is the one who made the paneling. This becomes this like local village community it takes a village to build a house, and it takes a house to create a prosperous and productive and happy village. This is this unifying concept of the arts and crafts production cycle. And Morris said, you should not have anything in your house that is not useful, which is a direct uh, contradiction of the fashions of the time which would have filled their houses with goo gods and gob gobbledygooks and, and ornamented this and whoozy whatsies that, right? To fill your house to show off your wealth. And the more decoratively crazy it is, the better, right? They said, no, enough of that. No more Baroque excess. Not in the architecture, not in the chandeliers, not in the tea set, not in the dishes. And so this is a, a, a philosophy of life. Everything must be useful, not just decorative, and everything must be beautiful and must have an inherent beauty, and the craft and love and passion of the person who made it must show through. And so those are the big ideas. That's the big idea of the arts and crafts. And so the arts and crafts is trying to remedy the problems of the Industrial Revolution 
and not just the Industrial Revolution, but also capitalism. If capitalism turns us into machines for generating income to pay off our student loans, then um, we need a solution to that. That's not a very happy existence. I want to find joy in the work itself. As if you were, who, who's done adult coloring books? Who's done that? It's fun, right? Why is that fun? I don't get it, I've never done it. Tell me, why is that fun? It's what? It's soothing. Why is it soothing? Yeah, you can shut off your brain. You don't have, yeah, you kind of get lost in it, right? Is that happening a little bit as you make your wallpaper? Who's got some good wallpaper? See some good wallpaper. Everybody pick up their wallpaper. It's fun, right? It's kind of fun. No? Okay, now here's a question. Can architecture be this fun? Can architecture be as fun and soothing as you think? Sometimes, right? Can you, do you ever, does it ever happen when you're doing Revit? Are you using Revit? Who's using Revit? So do you ever get like kind of swept up in it? Yeah? Well, that's, that's never happened to me. I'm like, ah, oh, kill me. Give me a pencil. I, I wish I could do it. But that's the question. I mean, this is not just the question of this lecture. It's kind of a correct question for your career choices. Is it possible to enjoy architecture so much that you would do it even if you weren't getting paid to do it? Because an awful lot of most architecture careers is all about doing it even though you're not getting paid, you're not getting paid what you should be getting paid. Right? So it better be really fun. Right? And if it's not that fun, maybe you shouldn't come into architecture. When my wife was in college, we were just friends. And she said, I think I want to be an architect. And I was working as an architect. And I said, no. I said, come visit me at my architecture office. I'll give you a tour everything we do, and I did. And uh, she saw what we did in the architecture office, and she said, um, I think I'm going to go into graphic design. She is hugely successful, and I married her. Oh, thank God. I have a chance to pay off my student loans. I married up, only because she didn't go into architecture. OK, so unless you love doing this, Okay, which brings us to Edwin Lutyens. He loved doing this. He was an arts and crafts guy. Uh, we always talk about Edwin Lutyens this, Edwin Lutyens that. But let's not forget uh, his landscape designer, Gertrude Jekyll. So it really should be Lutyens and Jekyll. And this team kind of really took what the Red House did, and they elevated it. Uh, they put it on steroids. Because it wasn't just about the house, it also became the house and the landscape of the house. Right? So the, this is the English lake country, all of these beautiful bucolic houses. A lot of uh, suburban America, the best of suburban America. How many people grew up in suburban America? Raise your hand if you grew up in suburban America. In suburban America. So some of suburban America is beautiful, right? It comes out of this tradition, some fantastic houses. A little bit of symmetry, but not totally. And the gardens, the landscaping around the house. So whatever there is that's beautiful about suburban America, chances are it has roots in the arts and crafts 
movement, especially when it comes to the relationship between these arts and crafts houses and the landscape around it. So thank you, Edwin Legends and Gertrude Jekyll. And so we have these beautiful things. Uh, sure, they're recognizably uh, steeped in traditions, even if you can't quite place the tradition. Right? What is that arch? Eh, not sure. It's a shallow segmented arch. It's got a prominent keystone, which they used to do in the Baroque. Uh, but it's not quite coherent. It's got a heavy timber beam, a relieving arch. It's, it's kind of mixed together. So again, we have elements of eclecticism, which is another element of uh, the arts and crafts. Is there's a certain degree of eclecticism as a way of throwing off the scent, saying this is not pure Gothic revival. It's not pure neoclassicism. It's not pure anything. It's kind of mixed up, which explains a lot about suburban America. Like, what style was your suburban house where you were growing up? It was colonial, right? How many people grew up in a house that was colonial? What's that even mean? Colonial is a real estate term to refer to the arts and crafts movement. Okay? Because, I don't know, it's easier to sell than calling it arts and crafts. So the chimneys are always a big deal. It's a chance to, to really get sculptural and show off your brickwork. And deep roof eaves. Look at that shadow. This is so warm and fuzzy, it's, it's, it's hugging me. This house is sheltering me. It's not gonna let any rain fall on my facade. And I can even go to the front door and the rain's not gonna fall on me. That's how deep these roof eaves are. And so here's some symmetry, but you gotta throw it off. You can't have pure symmetry, use the chimney to throw off the symmetry. Turn one of the masses uh, 90 degrees, put the garage over there. And so these houses are all masterpieces of this language, this architectural language of asymmetrical, ahistorical uh, compositions, beautiful compositions blended in with the landscape. Sometimes inspired by oriental sources. More on that as we go deeper. and handcrafted, so much woodwork. And this was their masterpiece, Tigborn Court. Again, there are some symmetrical elements, but you gotta unbalance it with the chimney. Frank Lloyd Wright, you're gonna see this again. Lots of expressive materiality. an artful making combination of stone and brick. So, since we're talking about Edwin Lutyens, the fantastic arts and crafts partner of Gertrude Jekyll, who really brought the landscape and the house together in the arts and crafts style, we kind of have to, can't ignore this other little thing that Lutyens did. Lutyens did this other thing. He was so successful in his uh, domestic architecture in England, he was invited uh, to come to India, which was part of the British Empire. And here we see uh, the British Empire. Uh, we, there was a corporation. There was one of two global multinational corporations, the two first and largest multinational corporations this one was the English East India Company. And uh, the, the company is gone, its headquarters is gone, but we have this painting celebrating uh, the beneficent Greek gods giving the abundance of the waters, uh, Mercury, the messenger of civilization, presiding over the unchristian 
dark peoples of the subcontinent who bring the bountiful treasures of their world and offer it at the feet of Queen Victoria and Mother England. Just in case you're not clear on what's happening here in terms of power. Um, and you remember this, this is Calcutta, the first headquarters of the uh, British East India Company in Calcutta. Uh, the house is there, and then the fortress, Fort William, that protected the house. And the house is a direct replica of the great manor house in England. So everything is in neoclassical style to exude the power and authority of the outsider, of of British domination. Well, there was a huge rebellion uh, in 1857, and uh, a lot of people died, and the city of Delhi uh, was successfully defended for multiple days uh, in a revolt that was designed to try to drive the English out of India. And it was a little too successful and people had made uh, the British very nervous. And so they said, let's dissolve the British East India Company, the multinational corporation, and let's, uh, let's absorb the operations of this multinational corporation into the nation state, which you will recall was a brand new cool thing to do. The nation state was the best thing going on, the most powerful thing going on. It was able to colonize. And maybe it was time to go for the multinational corporation with its own armies uh, and just turn over the operations of the colony from the corporation to the nation state of Great Britain, which they did. And this city that had so successfully uh, fought against the British became the focus of the establishment of a new capital. And again, if you have to reclaim control over your colony, who are you going to call? The architects. And so what are the architects going to do? Let's build a whole new city and make sure that this never happens again. And we can't really bulldoze that whole place where uh, 7 million people live. So let's build a, a new proper city based on, what does that look like? Paris. Houston's Paris. It also, what else was going on at the same time? What year is this? Let's find a year. Let's say it's 1912. What's happening around 1912 that we talked about? Yeah, that's good. I like that. Well, we have to talk about that. But um, I guess I should say, what was happening between 1901 and 1909 when he ended the lecture with on Tuesday? <coughs> what was it?
has to have been some relationship. It looks too much like Chicago, doesn't it? The civic center at the end of the diagonals. I don't think that's a coincidence. And so instead of this classical style, right, the, the original Capitol building in Calcutta, we can't impose this so much from outside. Let's be a little more gentle. Let's, let's sell them the idea of the British colonial system. Let's seduce them into thinking that we respect their culture. Let's invent this architectural style. Right? So the job is to justify the maintenance of this European colonial power over the dominion over the colonized peoples. And so let's mix it together. Let's take a European building, the same as you would find in Beaux Arts, a logical organization of hierarchy of functions, a strong circular circulation pattern, and let's dress it up in a costume that looks like the local customs. Some would call it vernacular. I'm trying to avoid the term vernacular, which is a little problematic, because it's a bit dismissive of local architectural traditions. Um, but let's dress it up so it looks Indian. And they didn't really like the Hindu style so much, so they, the architects, you know how the architects say, well, how about something in Hindu? I have some Hindu architecture for you. He said, no, 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 too messy. And too many naked women. OK, how about something Buddhist? Ooh, I like the Buddhist stuff. But are there really any Buddhists left in India? Well, there are not. Back then, Buddhism was not so great. Can you guys close to perhaps in the second to last row? Something way too interesting in the winter going on in the screen. Um, so, so we don't like the Hindu stuff so much. Buddhism is not that relevant. But Islam, oh man, have I got architecture for you. Islam is a hot new ticket. So let's mix up some Islamic stuff. And the Bible, in the old English Bible, used to call them the Saracens. And so let's call it Saracenic architecture which is a derogatory term for Muslims, um, but we won't let that bother us. And now the Saracenic style is all the rage, even to this day in Malaysia. Nothing to do with any of this, but they're big on the Saracenic style. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna do lots of Saracenic style stuff all over. Edwin Lutyens designs the new capital of Delhi. And he takes his Beaux-Arts training, and he does this. But then he, he puts all over it all these uh, Indian chhatris. If you had had the first architectural history course with me, you'd know what all these elements are called. But we don't have time for that. But this is what Edwin Lutyens does after his English arts and crafts phase. He comes and builds this capital. And he uses all the tricks of the Beaux-Arts symmetry from the architecture out to the long visual landscapes, uh, the long malls like you would see in Washington, DC. And there it is today. That's New Delhi, one of the largest, fastest growing, and most polluted cities in the world. You think Beijing is bad? No, Delhi is worse. Don't go there. Now here's the connection back to England that will catapult us quickly into the United States and allow us to finish a little early today. Does that sound good? Got your attention now. Um, and so part of Lutchen's Delhi uh, and part of the colonial system was very, very strong hierarchies. And so you show who's boss, you put the governor general's house in the center of the city and you have all visual things heading to the center of the city. Uh, like an emperor, so much for the enlightenment. And then you put the highest ranking officers in a ring of bungalows. The word bungalow comes from the same word as uh, the people of the region of Calcutta, which is Bengal. Right? The region of Bengal has people who live in 
bungalows. And so the plan of Calcutta took the indigenous, some would say vernacular, but not me, bungalow, and they adapted it so it would be suitable for British colonial officers to live in. And so you'll notice this is uh, several homes put together with porches. So what's a bungalow, and where did it come from? So here's a really fancy big bungalow. The idea here is that the porches are so deep, and in this hot weather, this became important, you don't want the sun. You guys know about solar energy? You know how to read those sundial charts? Oh, we happen to be learning about the sun, right? We learning about the sun? You check. What? So they somehow knew they were magical. I don't know how they knew this, but they knew what angle the sun was going to be at at all times. And they were able to design these porches so the sun never hit the wall. So these porches are climactic devices to keep the house cool. So if you surround the entire building uh, with a porch, you are keeping the sun off the walls. The other thing about the bungalow is that there was a social hierarchy. You've heard of the Indian caste system, right? Where there are Brahmins at the top. I can't remember. Who knows? Brahmins and the untouchables are at the bottom. Anyway, there are four very distinct classes. And then you take that, and this picture is depicting how the British colonial officer is put at the very top of the hierarchy. The tea server is really high up. He can walk on the porch. He's not restricted. And then there's the tea wala. He can make the tea. That's his only job, is to make the tea. He can come to the second highest level of the steps, but he can't go onto the platform. And then there's the fanny wala. He can't even get near the steps. He's got to stand way up to the side and fan the colonial officer to see the pulleys and the strings and that shade is moving back and forth to uh, keep the colonial officer cool. So there's this intense hierarchy. It's a social hierarchy, but it's spatialized. Remember, we talked a lot about how segregation according to space and status operates through architecture. This is a very dramatic uh, example of how architecture manifests as a tool of maintaining social orders. And so around the capital of Delhi were rings of zones so that the highest level of people could live in large households, large bungalows. And then as you move further and further away from the center of the Delhi, you got to lower and lower status colonial officers and then workers and then the soldiers uh, out to the outskirts. And so a lot of these British officers would come home from serving in the colonies, and they would come back to England, and they would say, oh man, I loved my bungalow back in India. I wish I had a bungalow here in England. And there you have it. That's how uh, the bungalow came to England and then came to the United States as a housing type. How many people grew up in a bungalow? Hmm? You live in one now? It's called a bungalow? Does it have a porch? It's not so big. It's still got a porch, right? Yeah. Houses with porches, if you have a one or two story single family house with a porch on the front that people enter through, there is some, there's a good chance it has a genealogical connection back to India. Pretty interesting, huh? So, um, one of the guys who lived in the guild, or one of the guilds that were started by Morris and Ruskin, was Ebenezer Howard. He was not an architect, uh, but he was a polymath, which is a name we assign to really smart people who are good at a lot of things in a lot of different fields. And here's this diagram that was in the sample quiz question. Uh, he said, 
There's something wrong with our industrial cities, right? Duh, everyone knows that. But what's your solution, Ebenezer? And so he said, we like the city because it's a highly productive place of industry and commerce and social, cultural civilization. But we like the country because it's bucolic, it's pleasant, uh, it's green, it's so wonderful, it's relaxing. If only we could have the best of both worlds in one place. And he said, I've got it. Let's all live in a garden city. Let's live in a city that is also a garden. Now, his garden city idea Despite what your textbook says, sometimes he gets it wrong. His garden city was actually pretty high population density where the people were, and then a sudden and dramatic opening up of the landscape. If you've ever flown over Germany or several other European countries, that's what it looks like. These people live in these very tight, have you seen it? These villages, and then it's farmland. It's house, 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 you know, these very dense towns, and then open landscape. Uh, it was more like that. But here's the idea of the magnets. The town has its appeal. It's a great place for civilization and money. The country has its appeal. Who loves nature? It's renewing, it's spiritually uplifting. Let's create the town country. It has the best of both worlds. To make a long story short, uh, the marketing mechanisms behind this idea often swayed in the direction of the country and not so much the city. We have a lot of factory bad things that we associate with cities. So instead of being high density clusters like you'd find in the Netherlands, who's been to the Netherlands? Right? Uh, instead of that, we kind of in the United States, we spread things out. Now we're back to talking about suburbia. What happened in the United States, it was really, the some would say, instead of getting the best of both worlds, we ended up with the worst of both worlds. Except for the school systems. Best school systems, thank you very much. But here's an idea. Uh, the, these basic ideas are still with us. We are still struggling with these basic ideas. What is the proper pattern? What is the proper spatial arrangement between urban aspects, transportation patterns, and the countryside? And so these ideas took hold with a vengeance, and there were a few attempts to try to implement it. Uh, the first one worth talking about is the Garden City of Letchworth by Parker and Unwin. And so they designed all the buildings uh, based on these ideas of uh, Ebenezer Howard. Um, and one of the key things that you see here is it's not just the parcels. It's connected to the main city with the train station. This is familiar. This looks like my street. Well, it's because it's in the United States, it's spread out more. Um, but you know, you get the idea, the streets are winding, the tree-lined streets, nice houses, um, church, all of these things. But the key feature is they would pull back and have some areas where there was collective green space. So especially in the middle of the block. And so the big innovation at Letchworth were these park spaces mid-block. So you have your own house, your own yard, and then there's a fence at the back boundary. You go over that fence, and there's nobody's house. It's some woods, or it's a park, or it's a playground. How many people had that? I did too. I loved that. So that's a Garden City idea that came out of the interpretation of Parker and Unwin at Letchworth, England. And it came to the United States along with the housing type. So there's a very strong connection between the Garden City idea, its manifestation is interpreted as a garden suburb, 
right? So it wasn't the garden city. The garden city idea was reinterpreted and implemented as a garden suburb. Every city in the world got a garden suburb between 1910 and 1929 when the crash hit. Every city. You go to any city in the world and you will find an extension off of the existing city that is a garden suburb and it has these kinds of houses, the arts and crafts style suburban houses uh, with tree-lined streets, curvy, curvy roads, and it was a global phenomenon. Very interesting. I would go to the middle of the island of Java and run into towns that were Dutch garden city suburbs. Amazing. Including the United States. And here we are in Pasadena, California. Green and Green were two brothers who uh, studied uh, woodworking. So they were craftsmen themselves. They were, wood they were woodworkers. And they studied architecture at MIT at a time when MIT, even though it was a polytechnic, uh, was also kind of under the sway of the Beaux-Arts. And so they had this Beaux-Arts MIT training, and they were carpenters. Crazy, right? How many people here are carpenters? How many people have worked with wood before? OK. How many people have worked with basswood before? Does basswood come out of a little nozzle and go No, but it does cut with a laser. So these were architects who knew how to build stuff. Crazy. And so they designed this house, the Gamble house. The Gamble, so this is a bungalow, but it's also a crazy mansion. Gamble was the heir to the Procter and Gamble soap company Fortune. And this is a beautiful house in uh, Southern California, just outside of Los Angeles. Um, and they drew the plans, and then they proceeded to build it making changes along the way. So uh, because they were builders too, some would call this a design-build project because they would improvise as they constructed. They would change the design as they go along. Uh, and every corner is rounded. The wood is highly, lovingly worked in the tradition of the arts and crafts. It's luscious. It's rich. The grain is always expressed. Whenever you can throw in a curvature, it's just another uh, opportunity to demonstrate your love of craft. The stained glass windows, uh, everything is a work of art. We're planting the seeds here for Frank Lloyd Wright next Thursday. Uh, the ingle nook, the nook around the fireplace. The fireplace is symbolic of hearth and home, very important. Uh, symbol, symbolism of the home. If there's no symmetry anywhere else in the house, you still kind of need symmetry around the fireplace. It's still, people are still designing houses according to these principles. Built-in furniture, the more the better. The more lovingly handcrafted, the better. Same tradition, also California. Bernard Maybeck, name is in red. Christian Science Church in Berkeley, California. Uh, that's a horrible Let's see if we got a better one. The colors are not so dim. But, and the wisteria is all dead. What happened here? I have photos of this. I lived right down the street. I should bring my photos. Um, a gorgeous, voluptuous building. Uh, because it's a church, he brings in the symmetry. It's almost like H.H. H. Richardson did all this asymmetric stuff. Uh, but when he came to Trinity Church, we have to go to all symmetry all the time. Same deal here. Bernard Zabak, arts and crafts, asymmetry, but it's a church. I think we're going to make it symmetric to represent and emulate uh, and exemplify the visual ordering of the church. So look at this. It's structurally extremely innovative. Beardale trusses. You know what a Beardale truss is? What's a Beardale truss? Instead of having lots of diagonals, it uses right angle uh, moment connection joints to transfer its, its loads. So, by the fact that they're calling this a Beardale truss, it tells me that these uh, decorative screens inside those parallelograms 
are not in tension. But it's an interesting question. So rich, voluptuous building, uh, highly handcrafted, very innovative. All of the uh, decorative elements are original. These are not copies of Baroque or classical or Gothic or even Islamic or Byzantine styles. These are inspired by all of those sources, but carefully denying a direct connection to any of them. Now his star protege uh, had a problem. It was crazy. She was insanely talented, very ambitious, uh, but she had a serious deficiency in this moment. What was her deficiency? She was a woman. Shame on her. It's a shame. She had such promise. But she's a woman. But she wouldn't let talk like that dissuade her. And she got a degree in engineering. She studied structural engineering. She was a pioneer of reinforced concrete methods. Her Mills College Tower is one of the only tall structures that survived the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. Uh, women were not allowed into the Beaux-Arts in Paris. But then they said, OK, we'll let women in. But you have to be, as with any applicant to the Beaux-Arts, you have to take the exam, and you have to be in the top 30 of the 500 people who apply. Right? So if you score in the top 30, you're in. So she took the exam. She didn't make it. But what is, did she go home and say, oh, I guess my dad was right? No. She applied again. And this time she got like number 16. And so they did what any school would do in the same circumstances. They would, they fixed her numbers so she got the 31 and they didn't let her. Right? Because what else she going to do? You can't, you can't really let a woman in. I mean, you weren't really serious. So she did it a third time, and they let her in. And then they said, too bad you will never graduate because you're not allowed to be a student in the school if you're over the age of 30 and you're 27. So there's no way you can complete the five-year curriculum in time to graduate by the time you're 30. Sorry. So what did she do? Yeah, she did it. She graduated two years early. She did her five years. She did it in three years. And then she came back to the United States. She helped design the campus at, at Berkeley. And then she built, she was one of the most productive architects in US history, 700 buildings. Crazy. So uh, one of the trustees of the University of California at Berkeley, where she got her engineering degrees, was Phoebe Hurst, the heir to a crazy fortune, who uh, was designing this crazy castle in the northern redwood forest. And um, Maybeck, her protege, helped with that. Then. Uh, Phoebe left all her money to William Randolph Hearst. Have you heard from William Randolph Hearst? Who was William Randolph Hearst? He was the uh, owner of the Chicago, um, San Francisco, and he is the central character in what greatest film of all times? Orson Welles. Greatest film of all times, Orson Welles. Rosebud? Citizen, what? Citizen Kane. Yes. And so this guy, William Randolph Hearst, the main character in Citizen Kane, said, I want a cottage on my ranch uh, south of San Francisco. I'm sick of sleeping in tents. I need something a little more weatherproof. And so for the next 30 years, uh, Julia Morgan is the architect of the craziest building.
building uh, complex of all time, San Simeon, and it is uh, basically a lot of fun. They go off to Europe, they buy up cottages and castles, and they take it apart, they put the parts on a ship, they bring it to California, and they incorporate these elements into this beautiful complex of buildings, some of it referring to the Spanish, some of it referring to Rome and baths, more architecture pornography here, the classical temple, uh, the Baroque screens. Now, I'm saying this in the context of arts and crafts in part because she came through the whole system of Maybeck. Yes, she went to the Ecole des Beaux Arts just like Maybeck did, but really she's doing this in the arts and crafts way. This isn't just draw the drawings and send it off to the job site. This is spend week after week on the site with an army of workers and work next to the workers and say, no, 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 not like that, like this. And so she is there instructing them on how to craft the building. How are you going to do that if you don't know how to build? Right? So she wasn't just a successful engineer, wasn't just a she knew how to do these things, and she was there, a woman, telling these men what to do. And that's why the building is so fantastic. So last thing to look at, is there arts and crafts going on today? Well, I was thinking about that, and I thought, this sounds familiar. Where have I seen this before? Um, and it turns out, uh, that I've been visiting this house uh, year after year during its production. And uh, I think this is an example of the arts and crafts because everything they do, it might start with a sketch, but they never put it in Revit. They never put it in AutoCAD. They just sketch it, then they build it in cardboard, full size, and then they show it to the craftsmen who are building it, and then they build it. They try a few things out, they adjust it, and the architect is there saying, no, nah, I think it should be like this. And she's saying, uh, you know, take it more here, do it more there. And uh, she's directing them on how to change it. So this is a seven-story mansion um, made out of... I don't know how to suppress the sound, but oh, there it is. So this house is made entirely out of bamboo, which grows in three years, uh, and it's gorgeous. A seven-story mansion, no walls, uh, and it's part of this assembly of over a dozen similar houses on overlooking this raging gorge uh, and it's um, because it's translated directly from from sketch to model, and then the model is carried to the site, and then the, the builders basically look at the model, they measure it to scale, and then they go to a pile of bamboo poles, and they grab a pole, and they put it in, and they repeat, and that's how they build these. And they're able to stick them into the ground. They pour very delicate little concrete footings. And so they can leave the landscape largely untouched. Because everything about it, from the foundations right to the top of the roof, it's all handmade. Furniture is designed. Um, that was a bathroom. That basket that was a bathroom. There's the kitchen. I was there the day she was, uh, the architect, Laura Hardy, was designing the countertop. And she was sketching it out on the floor with her hand like this. And then she said, yeah, I think that's right. And then they built it. And the stove is a piece of stone that she sketched on the stone itself. I think I want a burner here, and a burner here, and a burner here, and a burner here. And they carved out the stone by hand with chisels and set the, the propane burners right into the stone. This is the entry tunnel. 
crazy. So I think the arts and crafts are still going on. Um, I'm not sure my friend Alora would agree. She doesn't seem to be quite aware of her place in the history of architecture. But uh, every once in a while, I give her a hint. And uh, next time I see her in September, when some of the graduate students and I are going to go here, um, I'll see what she thinks of the arts and crafts movement. Uh, so that's that. So do you all have uh, beautiful uh, wallpaper designs? 